Welcome to Risk Roundup. Cognitive systems are on the rise. There is a growing belief that the time is coming soon when we will be able to address smartphones, computers, cars, enterprises, homes, cities, even manufacturing uh, material and get a real thoughtful response rather than a pre-programmed one as seen over the years because of the advances in com cognitive computing. As intelligent machines begin to think like human beings and as we move away from autonomous systems towards cognitive systems, they will undoubtedly increase our capabilities, reach and knowledge and allow us to gather data, draw intelligent conclusions and make accurate predictions. As a result, we are going to see a dawn of a new age where machines with human-like cognitive abilities works hand in hand with humans in solving complex problems facing humanity. To discuss the emerging cognitive systems further, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Arne Norlander to Risk Roundup. Dr. Norlander is a science and technology strategist, cognitive systems scholar, business agility and leadership thinker, director, research and innovation at Sekana, Stockholm, Sweden. Welcome, Dr. Norlander. We are so very honored to have you on Risk Roundup. Thank you, Yashree. Uh, it's an honor to be here and it's a pleasure to. Wonderful, Dr. Norlander. So, as we see, advances in neurophysiological and cognitive science research have fueled a surge of research aimed at more effectively combining both human as well as machine capabilities. So, in your assessment, how far are we in understanding cognitive systems to give human performance an edge at both the individual and group levels as well as global, national and local levels? Uh, well, uh, I must say that uh, for the next the last decade or so, uh, development has really accelerated. Uh, when I started doing my research in this area, uh, it was mostly a part of um, of what you could call a human machine uh, interaction or uh, uh, cognitive systems engineering. Uh, but the area has grown, and uh, technology uh, has uh, made things possible that we uh, couldn't e imagine. Uh, 15 or 20 years ago. Yes. Um, the developments in artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, are, all, are uh, also reinforcing this. Uh, technology will allow us to, uh, uh, to uh, realize uh, many of the concepts that we thought originally would only be theoretical. Um, if you go into the operational uh, environment, where cognitive systems could uh, make a difference, um, you can see that uh, since um, uh, since its inception, the area of cognitive systems uh, has evolved and is now, uh, I would say, ubiquitous in all societal areas, uh, in all work domains, and uh, in very or in a in a large number of scientific disciplines. Um, yeah. You could say that uh, cognitive systems, uh, short definition is that they in incorporate uh, human and artificial members. They are widely distributed across the whole theater of operations. Uh, cognitive systems can operate autonomously for certain time periods and in specific areas, but primarily they are forced to coordinate their actions very accurately with one another. And uh, this uh, puts special demands on uh, how to develop cognitive systems and what the requirements you would put on both humans and the technology involved. Yes, very true. Now, I hear you on that because uh, as we see, I mean, uh, we can develop autonomous systems where there will be, there is not a need for a human uh, player, but there is also a lot of areas where we do want to keep the human in the action or in the decision-making process, especially. So based on your understanding, which, which research themes do you see emerging for cognitive systems across nations, if we look at, you know, nations and all its components, like, you know, governments, uh, military, uh, industries, organizations, uh, and different industry structures, which research themes do you see emerging for these uh, cognitive systems? Well, uh, I would say that first and foremost, it's very important not to focus uh, specifically on only humans or on only technology. Um, you will have to take a functional perspective on uh, the research and development that goes on. And I, unfortunately, very few organizations or agencies are 
or taking this perspective right now because it would be very beneficial to the whole area if you could study what the system actually achieves, what objectives it serves, and what its intentions are. And this uh, would suggest that we could make use of the concepts uh, of cognitive systems in, uh, in many more situations and in many more uh, uh, areas of research. Uh, I have a so proposal for a definition for a cognitive system, uh, and that is that the cognitive system can modify its pattern of behavior on the basis of past experience in order to achieve specific uh, anti-entropic ends, if you were very general. It has three corollaries and is simply the three cornerstones of modern complex system science. Uh, one is that a cognitive system is capable of adaptation to the varying conditions of the surrounding environment. Uh, another one is that a cognitive system is capable of prediction of how the surrounding environment will evolve over time. And the third one is that a cognitive system is capable of regulation in order to reach an equilibrium that matches the current conditions of the surrounding environment and also uh, the predicted future states. That's a good definition. And the point that you made before giving the definition was that we should not just focus on the humans. That is, uh, you are absolutely right, because while we do want the human in the loop, but we do want to develop other systems where we can interact with the nature, we can interact with the animals, we can interact with a uh, lot of things that are uh, in the human ecosystem to get that intelligence, like why, when the earthquake is going to happen or why, you know, when the tsunami is going to come or uh, uh, when the, uh, you know, there is some uh, danger of some uh, bioterrorism. So, you know, we can develop many systems that can get that intelligence that would benefit humans, but does not need to keep the humans in the loop. So yes, that needs to be a lot of diverse, you know, research uh, that needs to happen for wildfires, for earthquakes, for all the natural disasters or the man-made disasters. And then, you know, beyond that, we can move towards cyberspace geo and also space. So we can get a lot of understanding with this emerging cognitive systems if we, you know, design good research programs around that. So the potential use cases for these cognitive systems are, could be as wide, varied and rich as the imagination, we can go beyond cyberspace, geospace, and space. So where do you see the power of more information, intelligence, and automation from your uh, perspective? Uh, well, I would say that uh, gathering information and uh, crunching information in, uh, in uh, large capacity computerized systems will only add uh, components uh, of, to the overall situation understanding. You have to incorporate uh, human knowledge and experience and, and make a successful combination of all this. Um, there is another concept that you uh, that have been around for very long, and that is the agent concept, meaning that the agent is a carrier of purpose and objectives, and the agent decides on possible actions. One action may not have more than one agent, but the same agent can execute actions in parallel. And the, it means that there's a special case in uh, what you call adaptive agents. This is fairly close to uh, what the concept of a cognitive system is about. And there are loads of research uh, since maybe 40 years uh, on uh, autonomous adaptive agents and intelligent agents, which could be very useful when you try to define the area of the research area of cognitive systems today. Yes, no, that's a very important point you made about adaptive agents. And uh, I we need to address that more in the coming years. Now, since cognitive computing has a potential for applications across nations and it's all components and also beyond geospace and cyberspace, space and even beneath the you know in the aqua space i would say you know if we haven't defined a term for the ocean or you know i mean the water deep water and all that we can probably call it aqua space so how do you see emerging cognitive systems changing human ecosystem in cyberspace geospace space and aqua space well uh, <clears throat> uh, 
I would say that uh, how cognitive systems or cognitive systems theory can contribute to, to this, it would be mostly in the information um, management and, if, uh, and understanding er areas, uh, meaning that you could use um, uh, large amounts of information that wasn't uh, available previously, uh, but it has to be coupled to uh, not only the, the um, capability to uh, understand and form a model of the surrounding environment, it also have to be able to, to model uh, intent. And also, you have to have an ethical component into this also, meaning that you, there are certain boundaries that you can't cross, even if you have the performance that would allow you to do it. And developing the ecosystem around, well, basically the physical e ecosystem, but also the information ecosystem has to be, you have to be have negotiated boundaries around this, where certain actions are allowed and certain actions are not allowed. This can be uh, put into doctrine or legislation, uh, but also into uh, teaching and training uh, human operators, but also in when you train the, the developers in what they actually are coding or programming for developing the technologies. Yes. Have, it is very important to see that uh, these systems can be, be immensely capable. They can be capable of things that we could not even imagine today, yes. meaning that it will have uh, a profound impact on how we will deal with uh, global problems yes. uh, in the future. It can enable us to uh, maybe eradicate certain diseases. It could also uh, enable us to uh, take care of the uh, global warming problem evenly. But uh, it needs to be regulated. Uh, it needs to be uh, under oversight from uh, human decision makers and policy makers, of course. No, that's a that's a very important point, and uh, the two points that you made that you know ethics needs to be an important part of the component. So I'm wondering if we how do we incorporate ethics or security aspects into you know the cognitive systems at the um, coding level, or you know this is not programming. Cognitive systems are not about programming, but how do you incorporate that into the systems at the, you know, the inherent level so that we don't have to uh, be concerned about whether the systems will, em that embedded, you know, information in the system is going to be effective or not. And the second point that you made about the regulation, how do we regulate cognitive systems? Well, I think we have to focus on the actual behavior that we want to to achieve into the cognitive systems that we are designing and developing. Uh, there are three main categories of the behavior for a cognitive system. One behavior or class of behaviors are compensatory, meaning that uh, the system will observe and then react to try to achieve some kind of equilibrium or the kind of performance level that we have set. Uh, the second one is the anticipatory behavior, which also can be uh, uh, regulated or adjusted but it has a predictive capability built into the anticipatory behavior but not only for the actual systems parameters or the actual goals or objective objectives you want to achieve but also on how future states will affect what you're doing today the third one is of course the adaptive or learning behavior uh, a cognitive system, if you uh, put that into action, it will be acquiring data, it will adjust itself, it will develop or even evolve, meaning that it has to have learning capabilities. When it, you talk about a cognitive system that consists of mainly humans, that's natural. Humans are learning, uh, learning organisms. But it also has to be incorporated into the technical systems that you develop that will perform uh, tasks uh, together with people, uh, but it also has some uh, some implications. It means that you will you will send out a cognitive system to perform some kind of mission in an environment, and when it comes back after it has accomplished the mission, the system is not the same as the one you sent away. It has learned, evolved over time. Uh, it has it has picked up uh, information 
and incorporated it into its governing models and you're not aware of it it's the the black box problem of ai is one such example um, you have to be able to more or less debrief a cognitive system after a mission uh, there are examples of this for instance DARPA in the uh, United States have a program called explainable AI meaning that the AI system uh, takes a decision or does something but it will also uh, be forced to explain how it reasoned when it came up with that kind of decision and reason uh, in a way that humans can understand yes this be built in uh, properties of all cognitive systems that you will be developing that's that's a very important point that if it can explain and if we are able to audit these systems how it is you know coming to that uh, particular decision or if there is a way to continuously audit or you know test the systems that would be very beneficial so that we know for sure that you know it still is uh, working for the benefit of the humanity and it is uh, not developing some knowledge or uh, intelligence or information or intelligence that uh, it would use it in a wrong way for the you know uh, to go against the humanity so those those are very important points and i hope that we are able to develop uh, more uh, uh, serious you know systems so that we can develop that understanding and that capabilities uh, to monitor uh, the cognitive systems but from your understanding which systems you are seeing right now that are emerging across nations irrespective for what function which are those cognitive systems that you find interesting well there are <clears throat> there are initiatives going on in academia that are very promising one is uh, uh, one program is at MIT, and I uh, don't mean uh, uh, the one that um, Max Tegmark is uh, pursuing right now, but another one uh, under uh, Professor Tom alone is called Collective Intelligence. Uh, it is an attempt to uh, make sure that uh, intelligence is developed in groups or in teams, mostly humans, but it does not exclude uh, technical systems in that you will build, well, more or less, it's, it's, an, uh, it's a very stringent version of wisdom of the crowd. Um, if you build collective intelligence in a certain domain or a certain area, uh, it will be more capable and will be more accurate when it's uh, employed in solving problems than if you, if you ask a thousand individuals. Um, uh, they have been published a couple of books, and I look very much forward to follow that program at MIT to see where they are going. Uh, another one is that there are uh, several programs going on in the military research domain, uh, not in Europe, but also in the United States. Uh, I mentioned DARPA earlier, and they have uh, several programs that are uh, very interesting. Uh, they are trying to employ artificial intelligence, uh, what they call third wave AI meaning that AI will be a partner or a virtual teammate to the operator or decision maker. It can be employed not only in military setting, but also in crisis management, counterterrorism, law enforcement, but also in uh, well, disaster relief, for instance. Uh, and then you will put it together and um, to work together with uh, uh, people in, in disaster management, but because the, they don't have a, a good uh, decision support or intelligence support system right now. You have to rely on experts on the ground uh, or uh, experts like geologists or, or, uh, or other experts that are very far away from the disaster area. This could be form some kind of uh, network, distributed network for collective intelligence that could be very useful and these technologies could aid uh, the development of that. Yes. But as I said, you have to have a functional approach to this. Um, it's basically not interesting whether or not a technical system or a collective of humans uh, are providing the knowledge or the expertise as long as the expertise is available. Yes, yes. No, very, very important points you made. The first one that you made about uh, the collective intelligence, that I'm really interested in that because for uh, several years I've been thinking about this, that how to use 
the collective intelligence of not only the humans, but the machines and computer systems in any form, you know, that we have developed all across nations to get the intelligence that we need for the security of the humanity. Because if we see, you know, currently, you know, there are so many uh, security risks emerging from uh, not only the AI, but also from the, uh, you know, nanotechnology, nanomolecular manufacturing, or, you know, synthetic biology, uh, gene editing, or, uh, you know, quantum computing, so, and bioengineering. So there are many, many security risks emerging, which uh, we are going to find extremely difficult to identify the risk in a timely manner to be able to you know manage the security risks that are coming towards us so we do need a collective intelligence we need a system that we need a cognitive system that can give us that collective intelligence and you know interacts with everyone you know humans as well as machines all across nations and get the information in a timely manner who is developing that uh, you know pathogen uh, who is doing gene editing who is ordering some genes by mail and who has that capability to develop some pathogen you know irrespective of whether it's bacteria or virus or anything and you know is releasing in the uh, any community to do, do damage to them or you know what other you know risks are emerging so we do need a system for that and i have been thinking very seriously about that that while we develop all these amazing systems for the benefit of humanity the ones we need to very certainly develop is the to identify the security risk you know coming towards us in a timely manner so that is something i hope that you know I, I, while i am thinking about it seriously i have not uh, started you know developing that system and i hope that you know we can co the world can come together to develop a system like that so mm -hmm. that uh, we can make sure that we don't uh, you know, get blindsided and, uh, uh, when the, you know, security, such, you know, critical security risks come towards us and the military applications you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I, I was reading about it. Such amazing, you know, uh, developments are happening to, in the, you know, to the combat robots and, you know, several other, you know, robots that are being developed uh, for the intelligence purposes. But now if we talk about one other area that is also very important is because there are billions and billions of these Internet of uh, Things, IoT sensors that are developed and, you know, put all across nations everywhere. So if we evaluate Internet of Things, the IoT is also going to give us uh, just raw data, you know, without any intelligent processing in the current form of the chips that we are using unless we start using neuromorphic chip and you know then it will be a different uh, case that we will have very intelligent processing right there in the neuromorphic chips but it seems that in recent years many machine learning algorithms have been developed to process the massive amounts of iot computing data so do you have any uh, knowledge about what is the status on cognitive internet of things well i would say that <clears throat> there, there has been a tremendous development in the last uh, two or three years in this area of Internet of Things, but it still is reliant on the, uh, on the standard von Neumann computer architecture, meaning that a, a, a system like that will, will crunch uh, huge amounts of data delivered by millions of sensors uh, simultaneously. That architecture will simply not cope. Uh, that's why I follow the development of uh, neuromorphic uh, uh, computers very closely because uh, I think this will offer at least part of the solution. Um, there, there are initiatives in neuromorphic computing. Uh, I know that IBM has uh, designed a neuromorphic chip a couple of uh, years ago. It was published in Science magazine and the, the architecture is uh, openly accessible and it's very interesting. Uh, I know that um, one of the uh, main advantages of a neuromorphic computer chip is that it's neural, meaning that uh, it will basically uh, spike or uh, react uh, only when it needs to, uh, not like a, an ordinary uh, uh, computer processor which basically shoves uh, empty uh, registers of uh, zeros or ones. Uh, and then it's uh, used a fraction of the time that it's actually working. Uh, I've seen figures that it, you could um, uh, uh, reach the, the energy efficiency level of a factor of 10 to the power of 7 if you use neuromorphic uh, uh, computer chips instead of regular 
uh, for Neumann based processors. Meaning that could you either the, you make the uh, computer system smaller and more energy efficient, and you could distribute the computing power uh, all the way out to the edge, to the actual uh, IoT sensor itself. So it, the mostly of the computing will uh, happen uh, very close to the actual sensor. And then the actual IoT sensor could act, just send a short parameter list or whatever to a central processing uh, uh, central, and you will have a totally different distribution of uh, energy consumption, uh, sensor power and sensor efficiency, but also in a reaction and decision-making uh, capacity. Because if you, will base, you are basing a cognitive system involving both human operators, decision makers, and, and, uh, uh, and uh, lots of technology, you have to be aware that just introducing more technology will not be helpful. Yeah. You need to reassess uh, how to, you should design and, and put requirements on the technology and the division, distribution of workload between humans and technical systems. I know that IoT uh, uh, is very promising in, in normal standardized industrial applications, uh, but I see even more um, benefits if you uh, will start looking at uh, other processing architectures, for instance. Edge computing is very important, uh, and that way you could also do away with uh, cloud solutions, which are very vulnerable to hacking, because the data will never be collected centrally, it will be out there uh, in the sensor network and accessed only when it's needed uh, and only by uh, entities that are actually allowed to access it. Yes, no, that, that's a that's a very important point. And I do see a lot of developments uh, at University of Manchester. They have uh, the spin maker, you know, the mm -hmm. uh, system, you know, in, uh, that they are, you know, working on. And then, you know, in United States also, there are several systems emerging. Intel is working on it, IBM, and uh, several other organizations are also working on it. So there are a lot of advances happening in the neuromorphic computing and neuromorphic chips. But uh, let's let's. Uh, there's another area you just you know talked about the clouds and you know hacking so that you know uh, makes me think that, that there is there is a potential of cognitive computing for cybersecurity if you look at it because we all know that we need a new cybersecurity solution that can block threats or eliminate the human error there's so many errors happening you know while we are uh, trying to do many things you know in cyberspace and then we do need to protect ourselves and our data it's not only just protecting humans, but also the data that is there in the cyberspace. So there is a growing optimism that the dawn of cognitive computing will uh, help the, the cognitive computing predictive analytics, rather, that, that will help us to, uh, you know, have an effective solution for cybersecurity in the coming years. Do you see some uh, advances happening in that area? Well, uh, I, see, uh, I see very promising uh, developments in the area of uh, autonomous cyber, meaning that you have, will have uh, basically fully autonomous uh, cyber defense mechanisms implemented in your systems. Uh, but it, it needs to be developed, uh, well, very powerful learning mechanisms have to be developed. And we're not there yet, meaning that you will probably uh, accelerate uh, and, and uh, lower the uh, reaction speed, uh, but still you will have uh, problems identifying the unknown threats. Uh, we have day zero events, uh, for instance, uh, events that are, have never occurred and thereby you have no protection against it. Um, that is where uh, you have the reasoning capabilities and prediction capabilities of cognitive systems could uh, come into play, meaning that they will collaborate with uh, experienced analysts, human analysts, it would also gather all the previous knowledge uh, in the area of cyber defense and more or less like uh, having, a, having a team of uh, both human experts and uh, Dr. Watson's that solves these problems together for cyber security. Uh, but still, there are these unknown events or the unknown unknowns that they are called. And this means that you cannot only have a very capable system for reaction, it has to be resilient as well. Exactly. You have to take a punch, then be able to rise again and continue working. 
maybe at a lower capacity, but you will not be completely uh, out of play. Yes. I think resilience and robustness are very important features uh, for the future because this will be uh, another barrier in cyber defense. Not only uh, rapid response or uh, even uh, prediction or intent recognition. Yes. Uh, there are things that you will not be able to predict ever. And that is where you have to be, uh, have to have a redundant functionalities. You have to be resilient and uh, build a robust system. The problem is that these things uh, come at a cost. Uh, and it's uh, maybe it's not very easy to persuade the chief financial officer to invest in robustness solutions once you have this tremendous AI-based cyber defense system yes. uh, that promised to take care of every every uh, thing that could ever happen. But still, you need to have the other defenses in place. Yes, very uh, true. We, we see this in uh, other areas like in, uh, in aerospace, uh, in, air, uh, in uh, aerospace safety. Uh, they reason uh, many times in the, with the concept of barriers. There are organizational barriers against uh, a failure or a catastrophe. And there are technical barriers and there are uh, training and there are doctrine and uh, there are, well, all kinds of uh, barriers that if they, uh, if, if all of them fail at the same time, you will have a disaster. Yes. But as long as one of them are in place and uh, active, all the others can fail and you will still be protected. Yes. This is a means of, of building your defenses uh, in, uh, you could call it Swiss cheese model meaning that there are slices of Swiss cheese with all the holes in them. And you will have to make sure that all, not all holes in the slices will align at the same time. It means that you can cover uh, or take care of the dynamics uh, of the situation and the various dynamic uh, uh, parts of, of a system in its life cycle. Yes. Uh, this is very interesting, and it's, uh, it's based on decades of safety research. And I think that could be uh, reused and uh, applied in cybersecurity as well. Yes. Uh, uh, another thing is that it is very um, uh, uh, precisely regulated. Uh, it's in the uh, frameworks of uh, all the uh, aerospace safety organizations in the world. And uh, it's standardized, not, meaning that it's uh, uh, established and uh, there are standards uh, that you could follow when you implement this. Uh, you're not uh, doing anything, uh, uh, well, you could say, uh, blindly. Uh, there are procedures to follow. Uh, there are also audits, um, and you have it regulated from the top. I think the cyber security needs to develop that kind of uh, solid base to stand upon uh, if we are to develop uh, stronger cyber defenses than we have today. Yes, yes, definitely. We do need to have a lot of uh, uh, work. We definitely have a lot of work to do in the cyberspace. And like you said, you know, there are so many unknown unknowns that we do need to make the unknowns known so that we can effectively come up with the solutions. But uh, the point you made about the resilience that we do need resilient systems, you know, and if you look at the digital global age, we are moving towards digitization and that we are using so many electronics i mean everything is electronic right now you know if you look at uh, you know any com any space you know in cyberspace in geospace and space and the fear the fear that i have is about the electronic warfare because none all the systems that we are developing all the electronics that we have you know across nations in all different spaces they, none of them is resilient to the electronic warfare. The, none of the chips are resilient to the electronic warfare at this moment. So if, you know, some anybody could use a small equipment, you know, that costs like $30, $40, or, and then, you know, be effectively able to uh, go just near the building and, you know, be able to destroy the electronics of that uh, building. So there is a, a lot of, you know, security vulnerabilities as far as the electronics go all across nations. So do you think we can effectively apply cognitive computing to electronic warfare? Because if we don't move towards replacing the chips everywhere and may use the chips that are electronic warfare resistant, 
that uh, nobody can destroy that unless we are able to do that do you think that cognitive computing could uh, come to rescue and uh, help us to manage the electronic warfare or effectively you know defend against it well i think that um, uh, in the old days uh, during during the cold war we developed uh, uh, systems that was basically impervious to electronic warfare uh, they were shielded uh, they were uh, Placed into um, uh, area or uh, areas that were basically uh, electromagnetically Faraday's cages, uh, meaning that you could uh, never access them with electronic uh, means. Uh, but these solutions were was tremendously tremendously expensive, and now you cannot cannot protect all the gadgets and all the computers that you have in your daily life, uh, not even in uh, safety critical systems. Uh, so cognitive computing um, could maybe add something to this, meaning that it will uh, help uh, operators uh, and they, and organizations to uh, be careful when they uh, uh, when they use this on a daily basis. But I don't see any solutions on how to basically uh, harden these systems to the level uh, that we had once uh, once in the military, for instance. Yeah. Well, we see two uh, two application areas. That is uh, in military and in aerospace. That you will have uh, the means and the uh, uh, and the budget to do this properly. Uh, in healthcare, you don't have that. For instance, in uh, ground transport, or um, you don't have that. And they are critical areas as well. Then, when it comes to utilities like uh, water supply and electricity, uh, uh, those systems can be protected to a certain level. But not fully. This is where uh, robustness and resilience comes in again. You have to have uh, spare capacity that you could uh, you could use uh, if your primary capacity goes down for any reason. And uh, I'm not sure that cognitive computing will uh, offer any solutions, but they could maybe add to the resilience and uh, to res make these capabilities more robust. Yes. Uh, uh, but there are risks and you have to accept those risks i think yes but the risks are so huge now because uh, we are no longer living in a time where uh, this kind of systems were uh, used by only military uh, where they could afford to you know put it in that uh, you know protective environment and make it uh, electronic you know their electronic safe because now each and every individual is using a computer each and every individual i uh, have uh, the, everybody has their data everything all their lives you know important moments and everything you know the financial data their you know family's data everything is on the uh, computers and if nobody is safe you know the, if you talk about homes or if you talk about enterprises or cities everybody has these systems now now you are right that you know, we at this point we don't see any merging uh, solutions for uh, making the electronics uh, safe for everyone across nations you know the in, even the systems you know any system we are not in a position to do that but i do see a ray of hope that i have uh, heard about a chip that is emerging that is you know resistance to all the electro any electronic warfare now if that is a quantum you know qai chip so if that if it, it still needs to be tested but if it's tested and if it's successful then maybe you know uh, we need to move towards uh, applying those chips everywhere so that it be, we can develop the resilience mm -hmm. that is so very necessary for everyone in this digital global age. And uh, I'm advisor to that company, so I'm uh, hoping that you know once we emerge from uh, uh, where we are at this point and we start testing, then you know we will have much better understanding about if we can uh, use this and you know apply everywhere, then we can uh, make everything resilient, you know, and then. We won't have to worry about any electronic warfare or anything, you know, damaging all the digital information that is, you know, uh, on uh, everybody's, uh, uh, you know, digital system. So let's hope that, you know, we are able to take that next step. But what problems do you see that needs to be overcome for uh, the successfully developing any and all cognitive systems in the coming years from your assessment that we need to focus on? I think that we need to um, uh, to make sure that we could uh, both we, we need to finance research in the area of course uh, and uh, 
since uh, the area of uh, uh, cognitive computing, but also cognitive systems in general, has grown uh, and has uh, relevance in many more areas, uh, societal areas, but also in research areas. We need to have cross-cutting or uh, uh, research going uh, between the social sciences, the technological sciences, and the basic sciences. You have to have uh, cross-disciplinary programs, both in research and also in education. Um, you need to uh, educate the younger generation to think in on a systems level, uh, meaning uh, merging uh, technical and social and uh, societal uh, knowledge uh, to make sure that uh, every aspect of a cognitive system and uh, the environment that they will be active in is covered. Uh, another one is that if you invest in research and, uh, and in education, you also need to uh, make sure that corporations realize the uh, the danger in uh, just pursuing the same along the same path as they have always done uh, because this is not anymore about uh, squeezing the last uh, uh, cent of revenue out of the existing solutions they also need to rethink their way of doing business uh, everybody's talking about how to be agile and how to be uh, lean and everything else but mostly the development is still old-fashioned waterfall uh, th there are a few examples, but uh, in order to make sure that you develop true cognitive and robust capabilities, uh, industry also need to rethink the way they are developing uh, their the new products and new product lines. It has to be more in line with the latest research, and they also have to uh, accept uh, maybe a higher risk level with their investments. On the other hand, if they are not willing to take those risks, they will be out of business in a few years anyway, because um, someone else will have taken that risk and they will be uh, overturned. Um, so I think that uh, this has to be, um, uh, there have to be measures taken throughout the ecosystem, both in, in innovation, research and education, but also in, in industry simultaneously. Yes, well, those are excellent suggestions and points because uh, that is the, the point that you made about that we need to invest more in our strategic thinking, you know, and understanding the strategic risk and invest in the right solutions and not be sh short sighted and, uh, uh, you know, get wiped out in the few years anyway by another competitor that could emerge from anywhere across nations. So, uh, everyone, uh, that is something, you know, I've been trying to create their education and awareness to everyone that that is so very essential that you understand uh, what your strategic security risks are because you know no matter uh, which industry you are in the solution the competition that could emerge from any anywhere anywhere across nation from any other industry that could uh, you know eliminate the need for the way you are developing your products or services so that is so very essential and i hope that you know everyone uh, focuses on that and pays more attention but having said that what would you like to tell our global viewers and listeners especially to those young minds who are so passionate about trying to develop systems trying to uh, solve the problems for that are facing not only their nation but for the future of the humanity well that's good can be quite, can be difficult, but there are a few general general advice that you could give to the younger generation, and that is never stop never stop being curious. <laughs> uh, make sure that you learn uh, during your whole career, uh, and um, uh, make sure that uh, the the companies you work for or the organizations you work for uh, have a, a strong and and solid strategic agenda in these areas. Uh, nowadays, uh, young people are very uh, engaged in the uh, both moral and ethic uh, standpoints of their employers. And I think that could uh, uh, accelerate this. Um, but for a, I would advise any, uh, any young man or woman to uh, engage in, uh, in uh, maybe um, uh, development of, of society and politics, uh, but also doing voluntarily work as well, uh, together with uh, their professional uh, 
uh, well, uh, what I do professionally, because I see that there you have to be able to collaborate across um, uh, areas that you have never realized they have are connected in some way uh, before. Uh, making um, making sure that you understand uh, larger parts of society than you did before um, could add to this. Um, you have to broaden your perspective uh, by not losing your depth in uh, what you do professionally. Um, I think that lifelong education uh, will be very key to this. Uh, and also uh, making sure that uh, uh, you have to develop another culture of leadership and a major corporation that is more inclusive uh, and more willing to accept individual differences uh, and also uh, have a have a, well, a global view from from the beginning if you uh, start up a product line or if you organize a strategic research program uh, the global perspective has to be there from the start nothing that you could add afterwards Yes. Because it, then it would always be suboptimized. Yes, very true. Excellent suggestions, uh, broaden your viewpoint and lifelong learning. Uh, these are some of the excellent suggestions that uh, you have given to our young global uh, viewers and listeners that would definitely benefit them. So thank you so much, Dr. Norlander, for participating in Risk Roundup today. We appreciate your thoughtful insight on cognitive systems and for doing your part in shaping it and helping raise awareness about it. So even if a single individual or entity can come up with an idea to help advance, or any young br brilliant mind can come up with an idea to help advance cognitive computing, this Risk Roundup Dialogue has been of service and we thank you for that. Thank you, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. So Risk Roundup, a global initiative launched by Risk Group, is a security risk reporting for risk emerging from existing and emerging technologies, technology conversions and transformation happening across cyberspace, geospace and space. We at Risk Group believe that risk management, security and peace, they all walk together hand in hand. Though security is related to management of threats and peace to the management of conflict, risk management is related to management of security vulnerabilities as well as management of conflict. And it is not possible to conceive any one of the three without the existence of the other two. All three concepts fit into each other. We believe that the security we build for ourselves is precarious and uncertain until it is secured for everyone across nations. Tradition becomes our security. So if we build a culture of managing risk effectively, it will lead us to security and security will lead us to peace. Let's manage the existing and emerging risk together. For more information on the risk roundups, to watch the risk roundup webcast or hear the risk roundup podcast, please go to riskgroupllc.com and do not forget to subscribe and share. Until next time, I'm Jayshree, host of Risk Roundup, signing off. See you next time. Thank you.